Hey, it's Friday night. I realize there's a lot of other places that you can be, but I have been looking forward to this for a long time. And I hope by the time that you leave tonight, you're blown away by what you hear up here on stage. But more than anything else, I hope by the time that you leave tonight, you can't wait to get back tomorrow so that the Holy Spirit will keep speaking to you from what you're hearing up on stage tonight. Guys, what I'm going to do for just a few moments with you is I'll give you a little bit of backstory from this video, this short video clip that you just saw a second ago. I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up in the U.S. Army and how I ended up in Mogadishu, Somalia, getting shot at and taking part in the events of Black Hawk Down. Now, I really want to tell you how much of a difference my faith made. And here's what I'm just going to do with you right up front. By the time that you walk out the doors tonight, guys, I hope that you walk out the doors with this same kind of rock solid, I'm going to use this term for you, this bulletproof faith in Jesus Christ. Because here's a little bit about my story. I joined the Army while I was still in high school. Now, you need to know that nobody was pressing me towards the Army. I didn't really have anybody in my family that served in the military. In fact, I probably skipped high school and went to the recruiter's office not even knowing what I was doing when I asked this question. I said, what's the toughest job in the Army? Now, you got to understand, I'm a high school student There's two Army recruiters in the room, and absolutely nobody else is there. So this is like a piece of red meat in front of a couple of wild dogs, right? And so I said, what's the toughest job in the Army? And this recruiter that's on the other side of the room, he says, it's the Army's Green Berets. The Army Special Forces are the toughest of the tough. And my recruiter, this guy that I was standing here talking to, said, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The Army Rangers are without a doubt the toughest men on the planet. And I said, I don't know the difference between special forces and army rangers. What, what's the difference between green berets and army rangers? And this recruiter, this is no exaggeration, he said, mm, let me explain it to you this way because I don't think you know what you're asking. He said, let's say that we were to take a special forces alpha team, about 12 guys to the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri, and we were to take an Army Ranger squad, about 10 guys to the bottom of the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri, and tell them both to get to the top of the Gateway Arch. Jeff, let me tell you what Rangers will do. They'll do in St. Louis, Missouri, what they did on June 6, 1944, on the cliffs of Point de Hoc in Normandy, France. They're going to take grappling hooks and knotted hand lines and throw it over the top of the gateway arch, and those bad men will climb hand over hand all the way up to the top. You know what special forces guys will do, Jeff? They'll run inside and hit the top floor on the elevator button because there's an elevator, and they'll just be waiting for them to get to the top. That's the difference between special forces and rangers. And then this recruiter said, don't do this because I'm pretty sure you don't have any idea what you're asking for. But if you really think you're ready to try, here's what we want you to do next. When you finish high school, you go to Fort Benning, Georgia. We're going to train you to be an infantryman when you're down there. We're going to send you to the Army's parachute school, the Army's airborne course. And while you're in airborne school, all you need to do next is just simply volunteer when these Army Rangers come by and ask, is anybody crazy enough? I mean, anybody willing to volunteer to serve in our unit? If you raise your right hand, we'll take care of everything after that. Now, what I didn't tell this recruiter, because I was pretty sure he would think I was insane and not let me join the military, is that I had this ulterior motive. I I wanted to join the Army just because it sounded cool. I wanted to go test myself and try out for the Army Rangers just to see if I could make it with the best of the best. But really, the reason why I wanted to join the military is because I wanted to get sent to war, and I wanted to see if I was ready to face life or death. Let me take you back just a few more years. When I grew up, I grew up as far back as I can remember with this absolutely, totally 
terrifying fear of death, guys. And I don't remember when this started. But I do remember waking my family up in the middle of the night over and over again, asking them the exact same questions. And y'all, my family didn't go to church. They didn't take me to church. So I woke them up in the middle of the night and I said, hey, where do you go after you die? And what is it like? And who gets there? And my family's answer again and again was, Jeff, you go to heaven after you die. There's clouds and harps. And listen to this. Everybody gets there, now leave me alone and go back to bed. And I heard this for years, because for years I woke up and went to my family and asked those same three questions and could find no peace. I laid awake in bed, absolutely aware, one of these days I'm going to die. And I don't know what happens next. And then when I was 13 years old, my family moved to a little small town suburb right outside of Nashville to Gallatin, Tennessee. And my next door neighbors came across the hall in this apartment complex that we were living in. Young couple that got to know me, they started to treat me like a little brother. They started to invite me over to their apartment and we got to know each other a little bit. And one night, I remember this like it was yesterday, They came to my apartment, knocked on my door. It was in the middle of the evening, and they said, Hey, Jeff, can we we talk to you for just a second? Came then into my dining room and sat down at the dining room table. And I still remember this, because this couple seemed like they were really nervous. I, I thought, these guys are acting weird. What's wrong with these two? Did they do something? Did I do something wrong? And they started to have a conversation with me about Jesus. They said, Jeff, I don't know if you've ever heard this before. Sounds like you and your family don't go to church. You are a sinner. All of us were born into sin. There's nothing that you can do to be good enough or to work hard enough or to pray enough to clean up the sin. You're a sinner and you're in desperate need of a Savior. Now, this couple didn't know me. But they also said, and because of the wages of sin, All human beings will have to give an account to God after you die. And then for the first time in my life, at 13 years old, my next door neighbors explained to me who Jesus was and what Jesus did for me. They were so scared that they basically kind of left it there and ran away from my apartment and went back across the hall. And that night, I remember thinking about what this couple said to me. And then it started to sink in. For the first time in my life, and I got out of my bed that night, and I knelt down by the side of my bed. I don't even remember the words that I said, but I knelt at that bed and said, God, I know that there's something after this life is over with, and I have no idea what it is, and I am sick and tired of living in this fear. God, will you forgive me? Jesus, will you cleanse me? Will you help me settle once and for all what happens to you after you die? Got back in bed. I woke up the next day, guys, and something was different inside of me. In fact, the next day when I got up and went to school, I was the same kid going to the same high school class, but I was, something was different on the inside. So when I came back off of the school bus that day, I, instead of going to my apartment, I went next door to my neighbor's apartment, knocked on their door and said, I don't even understand what happened, but I, I, I asked God to forgive me last night. I asked God to change me, and something's different inside of me. What do I do next? And they said, well, why don't you start to come to church with us? Why don't we show you what it means to be a Christian and to live out your faith? A couple of years later, I'm in a recruiter's office, and I'm really trying to find out, am I really over the fear of death? And so really what I'm asking is, hey, will the U.S. Army put me in a unit that has the chance to go overseas and to go to combat so that I can see if I'm really over this fear of dying. I joined the Army while I was 18. Went straight to the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment. This is a special operations unit headquartered out of Fort Benning, Georgia. And I spent the next 10 years there. Showed up as a private. I left there as a platoon sergeant 10 years later. Those are 10 of the best years of my life. The men that I served with in the Ranger Regiment, I would give my right arm for those guys. And really, I am 
the guy that I've become today, uh, largely because of them. So I'm in the Army. We're training for war. This is what the United States Army does and the special operations community. Our job is to prepare for a no-notice rapid deployment anywhere in the world. Well, after being in the Army for a couple of years, we start to get notified. Stuff is starting to heat up down in Central America. In fact, more than once, I get notified that we may be sending rangers down to the, the Republic of Panama to fix a problem that's going on with the country's leader. This happens time and time again. The beepers go off. Yes, I'm old enough to wear a beeper in the Army. The beepers go off, and I rush in with all of my equipment, ready to go to war, only to find out, you know what? They decided we're not going. Just put your equipment back and go back to bed. After a few weeks of this, eventually the beepers go off, but this time it's for real. The United States is about to invade the Republic of Panama. It's called Operation Just Cause. This is December of 1989. I've been in the Army for two years. I'm a sergeant in the Ranger Regiment. And about 24 hours before the night of the invasion began, my little small team and a handful of other guys loaded up on an Air Force C-141 airplane and flew down to Panama to provide a search and rescue force for the night of the invasion. My unit, the Ranger Regiment, conducted two parachute assaults onto airfields in Torrios, Tucumán and Rio Hata, Panama. Our job was to seize those airfields, defeat the country's military, the Panamanian Defense Forces, but really Rangers were sent down there for one reason. Go capture the country's leader, Manuel Noriega. So after the first 48 hours, maybe two days, three days, the Panamanian Defense Force is pretty much folded, and now it's Rangers and a couple of other spe special operators just chasing the country leader, Manuel Noriega, around Panama. We call this the hunt for Elvis because basically he pops up over here and now he's over here, and then over, all of a sudden he's over here. After about two weeks, We've captured Noriega, placed him on an airplane, and I'm getting instructions from my boss to get ready to fly back to the United States. The mission is wrapping up. My first combat experience. And I was in some firefights when I was in Panama. I was in a helicopter that had to make an emergency landing because of gunfire. But it was never really one of those situations where I think I'm going to die in the next few moments. In fact, to be honest, it was just pretty cool for a lot of it. My first experience with gunfights in combat, and I was just kind of overwhelmed by the whole thing. So when I got back to my base in Fort Benning, Georgia, there's still a little bit about the Army. But there's this big question about whether or not I'm really ready for eternity that I, I still need to find answers to. So I stayed in the Ranger Regiment, but the one thing that Panama helped me understand, and guys, you need to hear this part of the story, is that I was head over heels for my high school sweetheart. Her name is Dawn, and I don't know why, I just kept dragging my feet and didn't want to bring myself to ask Dawn to marry me. So when I'm in Panama and I'm getting shot at, the one thing that I keep thinking to myself is, if I get killed, my, my, my girlfriend, this woman that I'm head over heels in love for it. She's going to marry somebody else. You know what? If I survive this invasion, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go get that girl and sweep her off her feet. So as soon as I arrived back in Georgia, I bought a ring, flew back home. We set a date to get married a year later. And are you history buffs in the room? Because if so, you know that a year later, the United States is involved in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I'm in Georgia. She's halfway across the country getting ready for our wedding day. You know, she's uh, making, we're, we're picking out the flowers. We're getting ready for the, the wedding date, which is just a few weeks away. Well, you know how it is, guys. She's doing all of the arrangements. I'm just looking forward to the wedding day, actually the wedding night. And <laughs> I get the chance. I have to twist my commander's arm and ask him to let me make a phone call. And here's how the phone call goes. Don, I am talking to you over an unclassified line, so I can't tell you where I'm going, and I'm not authorized to tell you when I'm leaving, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be in the country on our wedding day. 
And there's this long pause on the phone, and she says, Jeff, if you're telling me that you're about to go to war again, you need to come home, and we need to get married right away. I said, wait a second. I didn't say anything about going to war. I just said I wouldn't be in the country on our wedding day. True story. She said, don't play games with me, Jeff. If you get killed, I want the flag. (laughs) She said... If you are about to go overseas again, you fly home. We need to get married before you leave. And I said what any smart man in this room would say. I said, yes, ma'am. And I got on a plane. I flew home. I landed at our hometown at noon. And we were getting married that afternoon in our family church, back on an airplane and on my way over to Kuwait. And I got shot at in Kuwait too. But it was nothing like I experienced in Mogadishu, Somalia. I'm going to fast forward now to Black Hawk Down. By 1993, I've been in the Army for six years. I'm a 24-year-old squad leader. I've got 10 men that I'm responsible for. And really, my job is to lead a long column of Humvees in and out of the city streets on all of the missions that Task Force Ranger does in Somalia. This is not my first rodeo. I've been shot at before. I know what combat is like. But for most of the guys that were over in Somalia with me, this is the first time that they've ever been to combat. And they were looking at me as the old man, the 24-year-old old man, to tell them what this was going to be like. Somalia was different because in Panama, they locked themselves in their own handcuffs and turned themselves into me. In Kuwait, they marched by the tens of thousands to surrender to the U.S. military. But in Somalia, they were ready to fight to the last man. Actually, they were willing to use women and children and whatever it took to kill Americans. So I get to Mogadishu, Somalia in the summer of 1993. Now, most of you know that the Marines have already been in the country for months. They landed on the beaches in the fall of 92. The U.S. Navy, Air Force, and other Army units were there providing food to a country that had hundreds of thousands of people dying from starvation and famine. Because America is a good country, we showed up and we tried to help make this situation better. Well, the country doesn't have a government, didn't have a military or a police force. And the capital city of Mogadishu had about seven warlords that were basically like gang leaders in America. And these guys are just fighting each other, trying to kill one another to become the most powerful warlord in Somalia. One of those warlords starts to target United Nations workers. He starts to blow up U.S. supply convoys when they're driving through the capital city of Mogadishu. And in the summer of 1993, Muhammad Farah Aidid and his Habergetter clan ambushed and murdered 24 United Nations workers from Pakistan, which caused the U.N. Security Council to meet together. And the world's most powerful leaders said, something has to be done about Aidid. So Task Force Ranger was assembled not to go hand out food, but to go kill kill or capture one guy in the country of Mogadishu, Somalia, or in the country of Somalia. It was a a small unit of rangers from Fort Benning, Georgia. We had a helicopter unit from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and then some special operations warriors from the east coast of the United States all met together and went over there to go get ID'd. We start to do mission after mission, taking down Aidid, eliminating high-ranking leaders from his clan. And we're starting to be pretty successful, but this thing has taken a lot longer than we thought. And we're getting a lot of pressure from President Clinton's administration to wrap this thing up and to get out of here because people are starting to compare Somalia to Vietnam. And we get a tip on Sunday afternoon, October 3rd, that two of these really high-ranking leaders from Aidid's clan are meeting in the same building at the same time. I'm going to get technical with you for just a second, but bear with me. When we get this tip, we almost immediately launch a mission to go get these guys. This is in the very heart of the part of the city controlled by Aidid. In other words, if there is Wild Wild West, this is it. And it's broad daylight. And rangers never 
do missions in daylight. You see, because of our night vision capabilities, we, we live like vampires. We go out at night, we do bad things to bad people, and then we scurry back in before the sun comes up and nobody even knows that we were there. This is a broad daylight mission in the worst part of town, and we're getting so much pressure from the Clinton administration that we decided to go launch this operation and to go get these two guys. Special operators flew in on Little Bird helicopters, just like you see in the movie Black Hawk Down. Other rangers from my company fly in on Black Hawks. They slide down ropes and they provide guns at the four corners of the target building. And as all of that is going on, I lead this long column of Humvees through the city streets. Now, we're getting shot at as soon as we get to the target building. But those, that gunfire is pretty far over our heads. I'm not that worried about gunfire. When we're driving up and getting ready to get to the target building, I get a call on the radio from my commander, Colonel Danny McKnight, saying, Jeff, when the helicopters were flying in and when the rangers were sliding down the rope, one of those rangers, we don't even know what happened, one of those rangers missed the rope and he fell about 70 feet and he landed on his head. Now, Jeff, I need you to get to Todd Blackburn, put him on the back of your Humvee, and get him back to our surgeon and give him immediate medical attention. He may not make it through the day. I ran up to get to Blackburn. I placed, uh, placed him on a stretcher. We had some medics working on him, just trying to keep him alive. And I split my men in half, put half of my guys on a vehicle in front of him, and the other half of my guys on a vehicle behind him, just to provide some guns and some protection to get him out of the city. I called my boss and said, I'm going to drive Blackburn back to the base. I'll drop him off, turn right back around. I'll be back in, out here in just a few moments. Now, again, I'm getting shot at, but it's pretty far over my head, and I'm not worried about the gunfire. But the roadside bombs and the serious head and neck injuries that Blackburn had, that's my greater concern. So I instructed the guys that were driving these vehicles to drive really slowly and avoid as many potholes as possible when we took Blackburn back to the base. We drive down a narrow alleyway, and then I made a right turn onto one of the major roads in Mogadishu that's about as wide as this section of seats. And when I drove down that road with three Humvees at about 15 miles an hour, we got hit from every imaginable direction at the same time. Now, you have to picture this in your mind for just a second, guys. Doorways, windows, rooftops, alleyways, everywhere. There were gunmen, rocket-propelled grenades, automatic gunfire. People were just lobbing hand grenades at us. This is like shooting fish in a barrel, and we're getting hammered from every direction. I've got a guy on a 50 caliber machine gun who's holding the trigger down and spraying bullets all over the place, trying to return fire everywhere because we were just getting hit from everywhere at point-blank range. And he wasn't being very effective that way. So I told him to take his machine gun, face to the left side of the Humvee, and pick up as many enemy fighters on the left side of the Humvee as possible. Another guy with a machine gun right behind me, his name is Dominic Pilla. I told him to take his machine gun, face it to the right side of the Humvee, and kill as many bad guys as possible if we're even going to make it back to our base. Now, there's a guy in the back seat who's going to take care of everybody behind us, and I'm going to take care of all the bad guys in front of us, and now we're just fighting for our life. And down the road, on the right side, hiding, waiting for us, is a Somali gunman. And when he sees Dominic Pilla, Dominic Pilla sees him at the same moment. These two guys turn their weapons to each other, and they shoot and kill each other at the exact same instant. Dominic Pilla is shot in the forehead right above his right eye, he takes a massive head wound and he falls over into the lap of specialist Tim Moynihan who begins to scream in panic. Sergeant Struker, pill has been hit, he's been killed. And guys, when I looked over my shoulder, it was like the whole back of that Humvee just got painted red with that man's blood. And for the first time since I was 13 years old, that old fear of death started to creep in and I started to think, I'm gonna die in the next few seconds. I'm not even gonna make it back to our base. But now as a leader, my training kicked in. 
And I remembered, Jeff, you're in charge here. And if you're going to get your men under control, you have to get yourself under control. So very calmly, I instructed Moynihan to take his weapon, face the right side of the Humvee, and kill as many of these gunfighters as possible if we're going to make it back to the base. Y'all, I don't have a time to tell you what it took for us to get back. But here's the part of the story that I really need you to understand. When we got back to our base, it's total chaos. The surgeon is running to get to Todd Blackburn to try to see if he's still alive. The medics are coming up to my Humvee to see if anybody was killed on there. They pulled Dominic Pillow's dead body off of the back, and my Humvee is riddled with bullet holes. And I remember thinking, God, I can't believe that I survived that. I can't believe that any of us just made it out of those city streets alive. And about that moment, my platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Moores, walks up and says something to me. You see this in a scene in the movie Black Hawk Down. He says, hey, Jeff, a second Black Hawk helicopter just got shot down. We've already put the search and rescue force in at the first crash site. Now Mike Durant's helicopter has crashed, and we don't have anybody else who can go out there. I need you to get your men back on the Humvees, drive out to the crash site, and see if anybody is alive at the Mike Durant crash site. Think about this for just a second. One of those special operators who was driving back with me, he overheard this conversation, and he's like, hey, Sergeant, if you're really going to go out into those city streets tonight, don't leave your men sitting in the back of that Humvee in all of that blood. He said, that will really mess them up for the rest of their life. You should probably go clean this Humvee up. So I sent all the rest of my guys to go get some more fuel, go get some more ammunition. We're getting ready to go back out into the city streets. And I pulled this one Humvee off to the side. Now, we didn't have running water. I didn't have latex gloves. I just grabbed sponges and buckets and brushes and started to clean the blood off of the back of this Humvee, and I am absolutely sure I'm going to die in the next few moments. Everything inside of me was saying, this is suicide. If I drive back through what we just went through, I'm going to get every one of my men killed today. The only person that's been killed at this point from our task force is the guy sitting right behind me, and now there's going to be 10 more body bags to fill if we drive back out into those city streets. And I'm thinking about my family. My wife and I have been married for almost three years at this point. We've been trying to have a baby. And I get a letter in the mail in Somalia saying that she's pregnant with our first child. And I'm thinking, I'm never going to see my wife again. My son or daughter will grow up and never know who their daddy is. And everything inside of me is saying, Jeff, don't do this. Don't go out there. But here's the thing, if you know anything about special operators, if you know anything about army rangers, you know this. They swear their lives to one another. They do it almost every day, and they do it in the form of the ranger creed. And one of the things that the ranger creed says is that I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. And I knew I don't have a choice I have to get on those Humvees and go back out there. And if I do, I'm going to die. And all of those thoughts from when I was 13 years old come flooding back, thinking to myself, I know I'm going to die tonight. At the back of this Humvee with blood on my hands, I didn't stop what I was doing, didn't close my eyes, didn't even bow my knees. I just simply started to pray. And it was something like this, God, I'm in big trouble. And I think I'm going to die tonight. And I need your help. And at that moment, the Lord started to remind me something. I'm reading the Bible every day while I'm in Somalia. And a passage that I had been reading in the Bible just a few days before this is the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You guys know this story? Because the night before Jesus goes to the cross, he knows exactly what he's about to go through. And he goes to be alone in the garden and he starts to pour out his heart. And his prayer is basically, God, I don't want to do this. Father, if there is any way possible, let this cup pass from me. And I'm cleaning the back of this Humvee up. I'm thinking, God, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go back out there. 
And then I remember, it was almost like it was yesterday, the words that Jesus says next, and it was like he was whispering them right into my ears. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And then the sinless son of God got up and he walked into the hands of the enemy and freely, graciously gave his life up so that you tonight could settle eternity once and for all. Amen. Guys, I'm at the back of this Humvee and I prayed, God, I don't want to go back out into these city streets, but not my will, your will be done. Whatever happens next, I totally trust it in your hands. And it was like a light bulb came on. I kind of feel stupid even saying this to you, but that's when the Lord reminded me of a couple of things that I have known since I was 13 years old. He reminded me, Jeff, your life is in my hands. It's always been in my hands. I don't know why you think you can do anything to keep yourself alive tonight, why you think anything is going to happen to you that's not under my control. Jeff, I've got it all in my control. But he also reminded me of this, and I need every guy in the room to look up here and to lock in on this. Because he basically reminded me, there's only two ways that this thing is going to go down tonight, Jeff. You're going back out into those city streets, and maybe you're going to make it out alive, but the odds are not very good. So maybe I'll be able to survive. Maybe I go home to my wife and our baby that's on the way. But if not, Jeff, I want you to remember something. Because of the death and resurrection of my son Jesus, because of what he's done inside your soul, before your body hits the ground, your soul will go to my presence and be with me in heaven. Listen to me, guys. The Lord reminded me, go home to my family in Georgia. Go home to my Father in heaven. No matter what happens next, I can't lose. It was like a light came on. Something switched inside of me. I can't even describe it for you if I tried. But for the next 18 hours, I rolled in and out of those city streets on the same Humvees all night long, multiple times, taking enemy gunfire and getting shot at until 9 o'clock the next morning and felt not one bit of fear because I know where I'm going to spend eternity. In fact, my friends the next morning were walking up to me saying, Jeff, uh, something was different about you last night. When everybody else was in panic, when they were screaming on the radio and freaking out, you're totally calm. You're walking along like there's absolutely nothing going on. I don't understand. How is it possible? And I had the chance to talk to some of my friends about Jesus Christ. They ask me questions like, Jeff, what happens to me if I get on a helicopter and I don't make it back? Jeff, what happened to my best friend who just got killed on those Humvees? Where are, are they right now? Did you hear what I just said? They're asking me the exact same questions that I asked my family at eight or nine years old. And I had a chance to tell guys who were lined up waiting to talk to me the next morning the difference that Jesus Christ makes when he is the center of your world, when he's moved in and taken up residence inside your soul. And guys, the reason that I'm here tonight is to tell you, don't play games with eternity. If you haven't nailed this one down, tonight is the night. Don't act like you're going to have another shot. Don't treat life like you're going to have another opportunity to figure this one out later, because you may not, I may not. Guys, I'm going to try to wrap up with this. I'm going to be very brief. But part of my story really is to describe for you, once you settle eternity, once you've figured out life or death, everything else is easy after that. In fact, I believe the baddest man on the battlefield, I believe the scariest guy in the room is the guy who knows exactly where he's going to spend eternity and has no one and nothing else to fear because he's nailed this one down. Look, this isn't Jeff talking. This is Jesus talking. Because let me tell you what Jesus says in the book of Luke 
chapter 12, Jesus gives this same kind of information to his followers. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 4. There's a crowd of thousands listening to him. And he says, I tell you the truth, my friends. Don't fear those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you who to fear. Fear the one who has the authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more. Listen to Jesus' words tonight, guys. You are worth more than many sparrows. How much am I worth to you, God? How much does this really matter to you? Well, let me demonstrate it for you. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. There's nothing that you can do to fix this situation. So God says, I'm going to step in and I'm going to fix it for you. In fact, I'm going to make the ultimate sacrifice. I am going to send my son on a suicide mission to rescue you back from your sin. And he will pay the ultimate price. He will give his life up in exchange for you to buy you back from your sin. And then Jesus says, if God has done that for you, and you've nailed down heaven and hell, you've settled eternity, when you walk out the doors of this room, you got nothing to fear. Listen to me, men of Memphis, the toughest, baddest men at work is the guy when he goes to work doesn't worry about his boss because he knows I answer to a boss much higher than that guy. The, the strongest guy in your neighborhood, the kind of husband that your wife needs, the kind of dad that your son needs to see, the kind of man that you need to model for your daughter is the kind of man who says, I will fear no man. There is nothing that this life can throw at me because I know I'm in the palm of my father's hand. If he takes care of sparrows, he can take care of me. And he loves me enough that he was willing to send his son to buy me back from my worst mistakes. And because I properly fear him, I will fear no man or no circumstances. Guys, if you will live your life that way, I promise you, your friends and your neighbors are going to take notice. Very quickly, the next morning after this battle was over with, my friends are lined up literally waiting to talk to me about my faith. And they're saying, Jeff, I saw something in you in the streets of Mogadishu. I heard it in your voice over the radio. You have something that I don't have, and I want to know what it is. And I shared my faith in Jesus with those guys, many of whom became believers because of the events of Somalia. But this is the moment I can take you to the exact spot on an airfield in Mogadishu, Somalia, where God made it overwhelmingly clear to me, Jeff, you're a pretty good ranger, but I want you to do something different with your life than just kick in doors and kill bad guys, as important as that is. I want you to do something in the lives of men that matters for eternity. And that's the moment. I've never really heard the voice of God, but it was about as clear as the heavens parting and hearing a voice. This is the moment that I realized God wanted me to spend the rest of my life in ministry. I became an army chaplain, spent 10 more years in the army, went to Afghanistan nine times and Iraq five times, and now have the privilege of serving men right outside of Fort Benning, Georgia, looking them in the eyes and saying, I know exactly what you're going through because I've been there myself. And having your eternity settled, settling once and for all what you believe about Jesus makes all the difference, and I am living proof. So guys, I'm going to wrap up with a prayer. And for some of you guys who came in this door and you kind of think that you're on your way to heaven, you're not quite sure tonight, you're going to hear how to nail this one down once and for all. 
for Pastor Greg. For those of you that are in this room and you say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I belong to God, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I am not worried at all about where I'm going to spend eternity, my prayer is that you will walk out these doors like Luke 12 says, and you will live without fear. And I promise you, your friends and your neighbors will sit up and take notice. So would you bow your heads and let me pray for you right now. God, you have drawn men from all over Memphis, from all over Tennessee, from, a, from many states away. You brought them from Alaska to hear from you tonight. They didn't come to hear a story about a guy who got shot at in combat. They came to hear from you. And Father, I believe that there are some men who are wrestling with eternity right now, and they're just not sure. And if tonight was the night that they stood before you, they can't say with 100% certainty that they know they'll spend eternity with you in heaven. Tonight, when Pastor Greg gets up here, God, would you speak through him, and would you do a miracle in a man's soul tonight? But God, I want to pray right now for my brothers those in this room who claim the name of Jesus Christ, that they will hear the words of Jesus tonight. When he says, if you fear God, you have no fear of men. If God is properly the center of your life, there's no circumstance, there's no crises in your life that will overwhelm you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. God, would you help your men, those that claim the name of Jesus, to hear from your Holy Spirit right now? Will you cause them to be bold men, courageous men, who will fear no one because they have surrendered to you? And when they walk out these doors, God, cause them to be the kind of men that their friends their neighbors, their co-workers say, man, this guy is different. And I don't even know what it is, but I want what this guy's got. God, I pray that if you will do that, these men will make disciples who will make many more disciples until everyone in the world hears what King Jesus can do for them. God, bless these men. Speak to these men. And then when this conference is over tomorrow, speak through these men to their neighborhoods and their workplaces. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.